So knowledge engineering is where your model is created by a smart human being rather than a computer that just exhaustively searches through all the possibilities. It's also called rational modeling or cognitive modeling. At its best, knowledge engineering is amazing. It's the art of a human being, a smart human being, becoming deeply familiar with the target construct, carefully studying the data, including possibly processed data like think aloud protocols, understanding the relevant theory and how it applies, and thoughtfully crafting an excellent model. At its best, knowledge engineering has the potential to achieve higher construct validity than data mining, because it's a human being really thinking deeply about what the construct is and finding ways to map it. Knowledge engineering can achieve comparable performance in data to data mining, that's been seen in a few cases, and it may even transfer better to new data. This is actually a claim that people make sometimes. I haven't actually seen good proof of it, but it seems completely feasible that in some cases that might be true. That's especially a case if a knowledge engineered model could get at aspects of the construct that are general, while the data mine models were trapped with finding features specific to a given population or system. If you think about it, you can imagine that the data mine model might, even with cross-validation turned on, find something that was a little bit specific to the population you trained on, and the knowledge engineered model doesn't have that same risk. So knowledge engineering can be a really cool thing. I'd like to give an example of some really excellent knowledge engineering, and that's Vincent Alevin and colleagues' model of help seeking. Alevin's model, like I said, is prescriptive, and what it was is it's a model of how students should seek help in an online tutor, specifically the cognitive tutoring system. In this system, the student is first supposed to spend time thinking about the step. If it's familiar, then you say, do they have a sense of what to do? And if the student says, yes, I have a sense of what to do, then the student should try a step, should enter an answer. If the tutor says it's correct, move on, you're done. No need for help seeking. But if the tutor says it's wrong, then the student has to say, was it clear how to fix it? And if it is, try a step again. But if it's not, go back and ask for a hint. And you'll notice you can also get to this point of asking for a hint if it's not familiar at all. At this point, you ask for a hint, you read the hint. Now, there are situations where a student doesn't need to read the hint, and it can still be part of a good metacognitive strategy. A few years later, Ben Shi and Ken Kading and Richard Shinas had this nice model which showed that some students actually click through the hints at high speed, get the answer, type it in, but then stop and self-explain it kind of turning the hints into an opportunity for a worked example. But this wasn't part of uh, Alevin's model at the beginning. It's not all that common a behavior. So Alevin said, you ask for a hint, you should spend time reading it, and then if the hint was helpful, then you can uh, go and try to solve the problem again. But if it wasn't, ask for another hint, and keep going until you finally get to a hint that's actually helpful. So Alevin combined this prescriptive model with a taxonomy of student errors in their help seeking which included things like help abuse, and there were subcategories of it, things like clicking through hints, which is a subcategory of gaming system. Also things like help avoidance, so a student needs help, but they don't seek it. Um, try step abuse, which included trying a step too fast, which is a subcategory of gaming system again, and other things. So the point is that through very thorough study and theorization of this learning system, Alevin was able to come up with this model of how good help seeking occurs and how bad help seeking occurs. This model was developed based on a pretty thorough process. First of all, Levin and his colleagues did a thorough study of dozens of scientific articles. The resultant uh, review paper, which was published in 2003, really landmark review in help seeking, reviewed around 300 different articles on how students seek help both in online and offline learning. So Vincent and his colleagues really got a deep understanding of the construct they wanted to model. Then they had years of experience in designing online learning environments. Including the team was Alevin and Kittinger, who were involved in the development of cognitive tutors for years, and some of their cognitive tutors are still used by around 6% of U.S. high school students. Third, there was intensive study of log files of student interaction with the learning system. Alevin and his colleagues really kind of embedded themselves in the data and just studied it very deeply to really understand what they were trying to model. And plus, even better yet, they had experience watching kids use this educational software in real classrooms. Levin and Ken and Ido Roll and Bruce McLaren are not just armchair scientists. They actually go out to the field and they really watch how the kids are learning from their learning systems. So you take all these things together and you get a pretty good system. You get resultant models that are predictive of student learning and even predictive of student preparation for future learning. That's right, they can even predict whether you'll be able to learn later on. And specific aspects of the model correlate to data mine detectors of some constructs and improve the data mine models that are added to them. So not only do these models capture the constructs, and capture the constructs in not the same way, but comparably to data mine models, but they can even um, capture some of the variance that's not captured by the data mining models, which is a great thing. So that's knowledge engineering at its best. Now let's talk about knowledge engineering at its worst. Knowledge engineering and rational modeling and cognitive modeling are sometimes 
used to refer to something different than this deep, reflective, high-quality, data-driven process. Instead, they're sometimes used to refer to making up a simple model very quickly, um, and then calling the resultant construct by a well-known name, and not testing on data in any way, and asserting that their model is the construct despite having no real evidence for that. This kind of knowledge engineering achieves poorer construct validity than data mining because there's no real evidence and no real attempt to really get great construct validity. And it predicts desired constructs poorly, sometimes even worse than chance, although you don't see that get published very often. And that's because they oversimplify often a complex construct. If you looked at a Levin's model of help seeking, it was quite complex. You have to have a complex model to really understand real phenomena that you see. And if you come up with something incredibly crude, it's not going to capture that. It may even fail to match it at all. And this can slow scientific progress by introducing false results. If you say that you've got a model of X, and your model of X is actually wrong, and you come up with results based on that, well, that's not what you should be doing in discovery of models. Doing discovery with models, we'll talk about in the eighth week of class, with a really good model, like a Levin's model, is a really smart thing. Doing it with a junk model, not so great. And this can even hurt student outcomes. If you take your model and you build it into a learning system, and your model's wrong, overly simple or just plain wrong, it, it's going to intervene at the wrong time, and that's going to hurt student learning outcomes. So how can you tell if knowledge engineering is bad? I mean, I've just said it can be great and it can be terrible. How can you tell if it's bad? Well, here's the thing. If a data mining model is bad, it's usually pretty easy to identify from the features, the validation procedure, or the goodness metrics. Sometimes even something's too good. Telling top-notch knowledge engineering from junk is a little harder because the hard work's in the researcher's brain and the process is usually invisible, at least in the final published paper. People who do these kind of knowledge engineering approaches often talk about their process only in passing, when actually that's the most important part of the whole thing. But look for very simple, even crude models of complex constructs, and you'll have a way of thinking, maybe I should be worried about this knowledge engineered model. That's my opinion anyways. Now whether you use knowledge engineering or data mining, you should be testing your models on data in some fashion. You shouldn't just be kind of throwing it out there and saying you're done. Even if you can't get a direct measure like training labels, you can usually get some sort of indirect measure, predicting student learning, for example. When you look at Olivenall's help-seeking model, he had some direct measures. For example, he used some of our same um, field observations of gaming to try to test his model. But even beyond that, he had measures of learning and could show that things like help avoidance and help abuse actually correlated to learning outcomes in valuable ways. I should point out, it's not an either-or. Feature engineering is very closely related to knowledge engineering, and careful study of a construct is going to lead to better features and ultimately to better models. Even if you're a hardcore, dyed-in-the-wool data miner, you should still be thinking about some feature engineering values. Understanding your data, understanding the construct. That's going to make for better features, it's going to make for a better data mine model. Using feature engineering models as features in data mining models can also be a powerful tool. You can take something like a Levin et al.'s model, put in a data mine model. 